Chapter 19. <clears throat> they all wanted me to sleep on the couch in the parlor by the comfortable oil-burning stove, but I insisted on making my room as before on the back porch, with the six windows looking out on the winter barren cotton field, the pine woods beyond. Leaving all the windows open and stretching my good old sleeping bag on the couch there to sleep, the pure sleep of winter nights, with my head buried inside the smooth nylon duck down one. After they had gone to bed, I put on my jacket and my earmuff cap and railroad gloves and over all that my nylon poncho and strode out in the cotton field moonlight like a shouty miner. The ground was covered with moonlit frost. The old cemetery down the road gleamed in the frost. The roofs of nearby farmhouses were like white panels of snow. I went through the cotton field rows, followed by Bob, the big bird dog, and little Sandy, who belonged to the joiners down the road and a few other stray dogs, all dogs love me, and came to the edge of the forest. And there, the previous spring, I had worn out a little path going to meditate under a favorite baby pine. The path was still there. My official entrance to the forest was still there, this being two evenly spaced young pines making kind of gateposts. I always bowed there and clasped my hands and thanked Avalokitesvara for the privilege of the wood. Then I went in, they had moon-white bob direct to my pine, where my old bed of straw was still at the foot of the tree. I arranged my cape and legs and sat to meditate. The dogs meditated on their paws. We were all absolutely quiet. The entire moony countryside was frosty silent, not even the little tick of rabbits or coons anywhere. An absolute cold blessed silence. Maybe a, bo maybe a dog barking five miles away towards Sandy Cross. Just the faintest, faintest sound of big trucks rolling out the night on 301, about 12 miles away. And of course, the distant occasional diesel bow of the Atlantic Coast Line passenger and freight trains going north and south to New York and Florida. A blessed night. I immediately fell into a blank, thoughtless trance wherein it was again revealed to me, this thinking has stopped. And I sighed because I didn't have to think anymore and felt my whole body sink into a blessedness surely to be believed, completely relaxed and at peace with all the ephemeral world of dream and dreamer and the dreaming itself. All kinds of thoughts, too, like one man practicing kindness in the wilderness is worth all the temples this world pulls. And I reached out and stroked old Bob, who looked at me satisfied. All living and dying things like these dogs and me coming and going without any duration or self-substance. Oh God, and therefore we can't possibly exist. How strange, how worthy, how good for us. What a horror it would have been if the world was real, because if the world was real, it would be immortal. My, poncho, my nylon poncho protected me from the cold, like a fitted-on tent, and I stayed a long time, sitting cross-legged in the winter midnight woods about an hour. Then I went back to the house, warmed up by the fire in the living room while the others slept, then slipped into my bag on the porch and fell asleep. The following night was Christmas Eve, which I spent with a bottle of wine before the TV enjoying the shows and the midnight mass from St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York with bishops ministering and doctrines glistering, glistering and congregations, the priests in their lacy snow vestments before great official altars, not half as great as my straw mat beneath a little pine tree, I figured. Then at midnight, the breathless little parents, my sister and brother-in-law, laying out the presents under the tree and more gloriful than all the Gloria in excelsis Deus of Rome Church and all its attendant bishops. For after all, I thought, Augustine was a spade and Francis my idiot brother. My cat Davy suddenly blessed me, sweet cat, with his arrival on my lap. I took out the Bible and read a little St. Paul by the warm stove in the light of the tree. Let him become a fool that he may become wise. And I thought of good dear J.P. and wished he was enjoying the Christmas Eve with me. Already are ye filled, says St. Paul. Already are ye become rich. The saints shall judge the world. Then a burst of beautiful poetry, more beautiful than all the poetry readings of all the San Francisco Renaissance of time, Renaissances of time, meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall bring to naught both it and them, says Paul. Yep, I thought. You pay through the nose for short-lived shows. That week, I was all alone in the house. My mother had to go to New York for a funeral. The others worked. Every afternoon I went to the piney woods with my dogs, read, studied, meditated in the warm winter southern sun, and came back and made supper for everybody at dusk. Also, I put up a basket and shot baskets every sundown. 
At night after they went to bed, back I went to the woods in starlight or even in rain sometimes with my poncho. The woods received me well. I amused myself writing little Emily's, Emily Dickinson poems like Light a Fire, Fight a, Fight a Liar, What's the Difference in Existence? Or A Watermelon Seed Produces a Mead, Large and Juicy, Such Aristocracy. Let there be blowing out and bliss forevermore, I prayed in the woods at night. I kept making newer and better prayers and more poems like when the snow came. Not off the holy snow, so soft the holy bough. And at one point I wrote, The four inevitabilities. One, musty books. Two, uninteresting nature. Three, dull existence. Four, blank nirvana. Buy that boy. Or I wrote on dull afternoons when neither Buddhism nor poetry nor wine nor solitude nor basketball would avail my lazy but earnest flesh. Nothing to do, oh poo, practically blue. One afternoon I watched the ducks in the pig field across the road, and it was Sunday, and the hollering preachers were screaming on the Carolina radio, Carolina radio, and I wrote, Imagine blessing all living and dying worms in eternity and the ducks that eat them. There's your Sunday school sermon. In a dream I heard the words, Pain, tis but a concubine's puff. But in Shakespeare it would say, I, by my faith that bears a frosty sound. Then suddenly one night after supper, as I was pacing in the cold, windy darkness of the yard, I felt tremendously depressed and threw myself right on the ground and cried, I'm going to die, because there was nothing else to do in the cold loneliness of this harsh and hospitable earth, and instantly the tender bliss of enlightenment was like milk in my eyelids, and I was warm. And I realized that this was the truth Rosie knew, knew now, and all the dead. My dead father, dead brother, dead uncles and cousins and aunts. The truth that is realizable in a dead man's bones and is beyond the tree of Buddha as well as the cross of Jesus. Believe that the world is an ethereal flower and ye live. I knew this. I also knew that I was the worst bum in the world. The diamond light was in my eyes. My cat meowed at the icebox, anxious to see what all the good dear delight was. I fed him. Chapter 20 after a while, my meditations and studies began to bear fruit. It really started late in January, one frosty night in the woods, in the dead silence that seemed I almost heard the words said, Everything is all right forever and forever and forever. And I let out a big hoo! One o'clock in the morning, the dogs leaped up and exalted. I felt like yelling it to the stars. I clasped my hands and prayed, O wise and serene spirit of awakenerhood, everything's all right forever and ever and ever. And thank you, thank you, thank you, amen. What did I care about the Tower of Ghouls and Sperm and Bones and Dust? I felt free, and therefore I was free. I suddenly felt the desire to write to Warren Coughlin, who was strong in my thoughts now, as I recalled his modesty and general silence among the vain screams of myself and Alva and Jaffe. Yes, Coughlin, it's a shining nowness, and we've done it, carried America like a shining blanket into that brighter nowhere already. It began to get warmer in February, and the ground began to melt a little, and the nights in the woods were milder. My sleeps on the porch more enjoyable. The stars seemed to get wet in the sky, bigger. Under the stars, I'd be dozing cross-legged under my tree, and in my half-sleep mind, I'd be saying, Moab? Who is Moab? And I'd wake up with a burr in my hand, a cotton burr, off one of the dogs. So awake, I'd make thoughts like, it's all different appearances on the, of the same thing. My drowsiness, the burr, Moab, all one ephemeral dream. All belong to the same emptiness. Glory be! Then I'd run these words through my mind to train myself. I am emptiness. I am not different from emptiness. Neither is emptiness different from me. Indeed, emptiness is me. There would be a puddle of water with a star shining in it, and I'd spit in the puddle. The star would be obliterated, and I'd say, That star is real? I wasn't exactly unconscious of the fact that I had a good warm fire to return to after these midnight meditations, provided kindly for me by my brother-in-law, who was getting a little sick and tired of my hanging around not working. Once I told him a line from something about how one grows through suffering, he said, If you grow through suffering by this time, I ought to be as big as the side of the house. When I'd, got, when I'd go to the country store to buy bread and milk, the old boys were sitting around among bamboo poles and molasses barrels say, What do you do in those woods? Oh, I just go in there to study, I'd say. Ain't you kind of old to be a college student? Well, I just go in there sometimes and just sleep. But I'd watch them rambling around the fields all day looking for something to do so their wives would think they were real busy, hard-working men, and they weren't fooling me either. I knew they secretly wanted to go sleep in the woods or just sit and do nothing in the woods like I wasn't too ashamed to do. 
They never bothered me. How could I tell them that my knowing was the knowing that the substance of my bones and their bones and the bones of dead men in the earth of rain and night is the common individual substance that is everlastingly tranquil and blissful? Whether they believe it or not makes no difference, too. One night in my rain cape I sat in a regular downpour and I had a little song to go with the pattering rain on my rubber hood. Raindrops are ecstasy. Raindrops are not different from ecstasy. And neither is ecstasy. <coughs> different from <coughs> raindrops. Yeah, ecstasy is raindrops. Rain on, oh cloud. So what did I care? What the old tobacco-chewing stick whittlers at the crossroads store had to say about my mortal eccentricity. We all get to be gum and graves anyway. I even got a little drunk with one of the old men one time, and he went driving around on the country roads, and I actually told him how I was sitting out in these woods meditating, and he really rather understood and said he would like to try that if he had time, or if he could get up enough nerve, and had a little ruey envy in his voice. Everybody knows everything. Chapter 21 Spring came after heavy rains that washed everything. Brown puddles were everywhere and moist, serry fields. Strong warm winds whipped snow-white clouds across the sun and dry air. Golden days with beauteous moon at night, warm one emboldened frog, picking up a croak song at 11 p.m. in Buddha Creek where I had established my new straw sitting place under a twisted twin tree by a little opening in the pines, in a dry stretch of grass and a tiny brook. There one day my nephew, Little Lou, came with me, and I took an object from the ground and raised it silently, sitting under the tree. And Little Lou, facing me, asked, What's that? And I said, That. And made a leveling motion with my hand, saying, Ta-ta-ta, repeating, That. It's that. And only when I told him it was a pine cone, did you make the imaginary judgment of the word pine cone? For indeed, as it says in the sutra, emptiness is discrimination. And he said, My head jumped out and my brain went crooked, and then my eyes started looking like cucumbers, and my hair had a cow lick on it, and the cow lick licked my chin. Then he said, Why don't I make up a poem? He wanted to commemorate the moment. Okay, but make it up right away, just as you go along. Okay, the pine tree... Trees are waving, the wind is trying to whisper something, the birds are saying, drit, 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 and the hawks are going, hark, 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 oh, we're in for danger. Why? Hark, 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 hark. Then what? Hark, hark, nothing. I puffed on my silent pipe, peace and quiet in my heart. I called my new grove twin tree grove because of the two tree trunks I leaned against that wound around each other. White spruce shining white in the night and shining, showing me from hundreds of feet away where I was heading. Although old Bob whitely showed me up the way down the dark path. On that path one night I lost my juju beads Jake had given me. But the next day I found them right in the path, figuring the Dharma can't be lost. Nothing can be lost on a well-worn path. There were now early spring mornings with the happy dogs, me forgetting the path of Buddhism and just being glad. Looking around at new little birds, not yet summer fat. The dog yawning and almost swallowing my dharma, the grass waving, hens chuckling, spring nights practicing dhyana under the cloudy moon, I'd see the truth. Here, this, is it. The world as it is, is heaven. I'm looking for a heaven outside and what there is. It's only this poor, pitiful world that's heaven. Ah, oh, if I could re realize, if I could forget myself and devote my meditations to the freeing, the awakening, and the blessedness of all living creatures everywhere, I'd realize what there is is ecstasy. Long afternoons just sitting in the straw until I was tired of thinking nothing and just going to sleep and having little flash dreams like the strange one I had once of being up in some kind of gray ghostly attic calling up suitcases of gray meat my mother is handing up and I'm petulantly complaining. I won't come down again to do this work of the world. I thought I was a blank being called upon to enjoy the ecstasy of the endless true body. Days tumbled on days. I was in my overalls. Didn't comb my hair. Didn't shave much. Consorted only with dogs and cats. I was living the happy life of childhood again. Meanwhile, I wrote and got an assignment for the coming summer as a fire lookout at the U.S. Forest Service on Desolation Peak in the High Cascades in Washington State. So I figured to set out 
for Chafee Shack in March to be near Washington for my summer job. Sunday afternoons, my family would want me to go driving with them, but I preferred to stay home alone, and they'd get mad and say, What's the matter with him, anyway? And I'd hear them argue about the futility of my Buddhism in the kitchen. Then they'll all get in the car and leave, and I'd go in the kitchen and sing, The tables are empty, everybody's gone over, to the tune of Frank Sinatra's You're Learning the Blues. I was as nutty as a fruitcake and happier. Sunday afternoon, then I'd go, go to my woods with the dogs and sit and put on my hands, I'd put out my hands, palms up, and accept handfuls of sun boiling over the palms. Nirvana is the moving paw, I'd say, seeing the first thing I saw as I opened my eyes for meditation, that being Bob's paw moving in the grass as he dreamed. Then I'd go back to the house on my clear, pure, well-traveled path, waiting for the night, when again I'd see the countless Buddhas hiding in the moonlight air. But my serenity was finally disturbed by a curious argument with my brother-in-law. He began, to he began to resent my unshackling Bob the dog and taking him in the woods with me. I've got too much money investing that dog to untie him from his chain. I said, well, how would you like to be tied to a chain and cry all day like the dog? He replied, doesn't bother me. And my sister said, and I don't care. I got so mad I stomped off into the woods. It was a Sunday afternoon and resolved to sit there without food till midnight and come back and pack my things in the night and leave. But in a few hours, my mother was calling me from the back porch to supper. I wouldn't come. Finally, little Lou came out to my tree and begged me to come back. I had frogs in the little brook that kept croaking at the oddest times, interrupting my meditations as, my meditations as if by design. Once at high noon, a frog croaked three times and was silent the rest of the day, as though expounding me the triple vehicle. Now my frog croaked once. I felt it was a signal, meaning the one vehicle of compassion. I went back determined to overlook the whole thing, even my pity about the dog. What a sad and bootless dream. In the woods again that night, fingering the juju beads, I went through curious prayers like these. My pride is hurt, that is emptiness. My business is with the Dharma, that is emptiness. I'm proud of my kindness to animals, that is emptiness. My conception of the chin, that is emptiness. Ananda's pity, even that is emptiness. Perhaps if some old Zen master had been on the scene, he would have gone out and kicked the dog on his chain to give everybody a sudden shot of awakening. My pain was in getting rid of the conception of people and dogs anyway, and of myself, and I was hurting deep inside from the sad business of trying to deny what I was. In any case, it was tender. It was a tender little drama in the Sunday countryside. Raymond doesn't want the dog chained. But then suddenly, under the tree at night, I had the astonishing idea. Everything is empty but awake. Things are empty in time and space and mind. I figured it all out, and the next day, feeling very exhilarated, I felt the time had come to explain everything to my family. They laughed more than anything else. But listen, no, look, it's simple. Let me lay it out as simple and concise as I can. All things are empty, ain't they? What do you mean, empty? I'm holding this orange in my hand, ain't I? It's empty. Everything's empty. Things come but to go. All things made have to be unmade, and they'll have to be unmade simply because they were made. Nobody would even buy that, they say. You and your you and your Buddha, why don't you stick to the religion you were born with, my mother and sister said. Everything's gone, already gone, already come and gone, I yelled. Ah, oh, stepping around, coming back. And things are empty because they appear, don't they? You see them, but they're made up of atoms, and that can't be measured or weighed or taken hold of. Even the dumb scientists know that now. There isn't any finding of the farthest atom so-called. Things are just empty arrangements of something that seems solid appearing in the space. They neither big or small, near or far, true or false. They're ghosts, pure and simple. Ghosties, yelled little Lou, amazed. He really agreed with me, but he was afraid of my insistence on ghosties. Look, said my brother-in-law, if things were empty, how could I feel this orange? In fact, taste it and swallow it. Answer me that. Your mind makes out the orange by seeing it, hearing it, touching it, smelling it, tasting it, and thinking about it. But without this mind, you call it the orange would not be seen or heard or smelled or tasted or even mentally noticed. It's actually that orange, depending on your mind, to exist. Don't you see that? By itself, it's a no thing. It's really mental. It's seen only of your mind. In other words, it's empty and awake. Well, if that's so, I still don't care. All enthusiastic, I went back to the woods that night and thought, what does it mean that I am in the endless universe, thinking that I'm a man sitting under the stars on the terrace of the earth, but actually empty and awake throughout the emptiness and awakeness of everything? It means that I'm empty and awake, that I know I'm empty awake, and that there's no difference between me and anything else. In other words, it means that I've become the same as everything else. It means I've become a Buddha. I really felt that and believed it and exulted to, to think that when I had to 
exulted to think what I had to tell Jaffe now when I got back to California. At least he'll listen, I pouted. I felt great compassion for the trees because we were the same thing. Pain of the dogs who didn't argue with me ever. All dogs love God. They're wiser than their masters. I told that to the dogs, too. They listened to me perking up the ears and licking my face. They didn't care one way or the other as long as I was there. St. Raymond of the dogs is who I was that year, if no one or nothing else. Sometimes in the woods I'd just sit and stare at things themselves, trying to divine the secret of existence anyway. I'd stare at the holy yellow long bowing weeds that faced my grass sitmat of Tathagata Sita Purity as they pointed in all directions, and hairily conversed as the winds dictated ta-ta-ta in gossip groups with some lone weeds proud to show off on the side, or sick ones and half-dead falling ones, the whole congregation of living weedhood in the wind suddenly ringing like bells and jumping to get excited, at all made of yellow stuff and sticking to the ground, and I'd think, this is it. Rop, 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 I'd yell at the weeds, and they'd show windward pointing intelligent creatures to indicate and flail and finagle some rooted in blossom imagination earth moist perturbation idea that had karmicized with their very root and stem it was eerie i'd fall asleep and dream the words by this teaching the earth came to an end in a dream of my ma nodding solemnly with her whole head oomph and eyes closed what did, I, what did i care about all the irking hurts and tedious wrongs of the world the human bones are but vain lines dawdling the whole universe a blank mold of stars. I'm a bhikkhu blank rat, I dreamed. What did I care about the squawk of the little very self which wanders everywhere? I was dealing in outblowness, cut offness, snipped, blow outnesses, put outness, turned offness, nothing happensness, goneness, gone outness, the snap link, near link, van a snap, the dust of my thoughts collected into a globe, I thought, in this ageless solitude, I thought and really smiled because I was seeing the white light everywhere, everything, at last. The warm wind made the pines talk deep one night when I began to experience what is called samat, samapati, which in Sanskrit means transcendental visits. I had got a little drowsy in the mind, but was somehow physically wide awake, sitting erect under my tree, when suddenly I saw flowers, pink worlds of walls of them, salmon pink, in the shh of silent woods. Obtaining nirvana is like locating silence. And I saw an ancient vision of Dipankara Buddha, who was the Buddha who never said anything. Dipankara was a vast, as a vast snowy pyramid Buddha, with bushy wild black eyebrows like John L. Lewis, and a terrible stare, all in an old location, an ancient snowy field like Alban. A new field had yelled the Negro preacher woman, the whole vision making my hair rise. I remember the strange magic final cry that it evoked in me, whatever it means. Kalia Kalor! It is the vision, was devoid of any sensation of I being myself. It was pure egolessness, just simply wild ethereal activities, devoid of any wrong predicates, devoid of effort, devoid of mistake. Everything's all right, I thought. Form is emptiness, and emptiness is form. And we're here forever in one form or another, which is empty. What the dead have accomplished, this rich, silent hush of the pure, awakened land. I felt like crying out over the woods and rooftops of North Carolina, announcing the glorious and simple truth. Then I said, I've got my full rucksack pack, and it's spring. I'm going to go southwest to the dry land, to the long, lone land of Texas and Chihuahua, and the gay streets of Mexico, night. Music coming out of doors, girls, wi wine, weed, wild hats, viva! What does it matter? Like the ants, they have nothing to do but dig all day. I have nothing to do but do what I want and be kind and remain nevertheless uninfluenced by imaginary judgments and pray for the light. Sitting in my Buddha arbor, therefore, in that colia color wall of flowers pink and red and ivory white, among aviaries of magic transcendent birds recognizing me awakened my amboike. Among aviary, aviaries of magic transcendent birds recognizing my awakening mind with sweet weird cries, the pathless lark, in the ethereal perfume, mysteriously ancient, the bliss of the Buddha fields. I saw that my life was a vast, glowing, empty page that I could do anything I wanted. A strange thing happened the next day, to illustrate the true power I had gained from these magic visions. My mother had been coughing for five days and her nose was running, and now her throat was beginning to hurt so much that her coughs were painful and sounded dangerous to me. I decided to go into a deep trance and hypnotize myself, reminding myself I was empty and awake to investigate the cause and cure of my mother's illness. Instantly, in my closed eyes, I saw a vision of a brandy bottle, which I then 
which then I saw to be heat rubbing medicine. On top of that, superimposed like a movie fade in, I saw a distinct picture of little white flowers round the small petals. I instantly got up. It was midnight. My mother was coughing in her bed, and I went and took several bowls of bachelor's buttons my sister had arranged around the house the week before, and I set them outside. Then I took some heat out of the medicine cabinet and told my mother to rub it on her neck. The next day, her cough was gone. Later on, after I was gone hitchhiking west, a nurse friend of ours heard the story and said, Yes, it sounds like an allergy, allergy to the flowers. During this vision and this action, I knew perfectly, perfectly clearly that people get sick by utilizing physical opportunities to punish themselves because of their self-regulating God nature, or Buddha nature, or Allah nature, or any name you want to give God, and everything worked automatically that way. This was my first and last miracle because I was afraid of getting too interested in this and becoming vain. I was a little scared, too, of all the responsibility. Everybody in the family heard of my vision and what I did, but they didn't seem to think much of it. In fact, I didn't either. That was right. I was very rich now, a super myriad trillionaire in some of Hati transcendental graces. Because of good, humble karma, maybe because I had pitied the dog and forgiven men. But I knew now that I was a bliss hare, and that the final sin, the worst, is righteousness. So I would shut up and just hit the road and go see Jaffe. Don't let the blues make you bad, sings Frank Sinatra. On my final note in the woods, the eve of my departure, by, by thumb, I heard the word star body, concerning how things don't have to be made to disappear, but to awake, so their supremely pure true body and star body. I saw there was nothing to do because nothing ever happened, nothing ever would happen, all things were empty life. So I took off well fortified with my pack, kissing my mother goodbye. She had paid five dollars to have brand new thick rubber soles with cleats put on the bottom of my old boots, and now I was all set for a summer working in the mountains. Our old country store friend, Booty Tom, a character in his own right, took me in his vehicle out to Highway 64, and there we waved goodbye, and I started hitchhiking 3,000 miles back to California. I would be home again the next Christmas. Chapter 22 Meanwhile, J.P. was waiting for me in his nice little shack in Corte Madera, California. He was settled in Sean Monahan's hermitage. A wooden cabin built behind a cypress windrow on a steep little grassy hill also covered with eucalyptus and pine behind Sean's main house. The shack had been built by an old man to die in years ago. It was well built. I was invited to go live there as long as I wanted, rent free. The shack had been made habitable after years as a wreck by Sean Monian's brother-in-law, Whitey Jones, a good young carpenter who had put in burlap over the wood walls and a good wood stove and a kerosene lamp and then never lived in it having to go to work out of town. So Jaffe's moved in to finish his studies and live the good solitary life. If anybody wanted to go see him, it was a steep climb. On the floor were woven grass mats, and Jaffe said in a letter, I sit and smoke a pipe and drink tea and hear the wind beat the slender eucalyptus limbs like whips, and the cypress wind row roars. He had stayed there until May 15th, his sailing date for Japan, where he had been invited by an American foundation to stay in a monastery, and study under a master. Meanwhile, wrote Jaffe, come share a wild man's dark cabin with wine and weekend girls and a good and good pots of food and wood fire heat. Monahan will give us grocery bucks to fall a few trees to fell a few trees in his big yard and buck and split them out for firewood and I'll teach you all about logging. During that winter Jaffe had hitchhiked up to his home country in the northwest, up through Portland and snow farther up to the Blue Ice Glacier country, finally northern Washington on the farm of a friend in the Nooksack Valley, a week in a berry picker split shake cabin and a few climbs around. The names like Nooksack and Mount Baker National Forest excited my mind a beautiful crystal vision of snow and ice and pines in the far north of my childhood dreams. But I was standing on the very hot April road of North Carolina waiting for my first ride, which came very soon from a young high school kid who took me to a country town called Nashville. Where I broiled in the sun a half hour to get till I got a ride from a taciturn but kindly naval officer who drove me clear to Greenville, South Carolina. After that whole winter and early spring of incredible peace, sleeping on my porch and resting in my woods, the stint of hitchhiking was harder than ever, more like hell than ever. In Greenville, in fact, I walked three miles in the burning sun for nothing, lost in the maze of downtown back streets, looking for a certain highway, and at one point passed a kind of forge where colored men were all black and sweaty and covered with coal, and I cried. I'm almost sud suddenly in hell again as I felt the blast of heat. But it began to rain on the road, and few rides took me into the rainy night of Georgia, where I rested, sitting on my pack under the overhanging sidewalk roofs, 
of old hardware stores, and drank a half pint of wine. A rainy night, no rides. When the Greyhound bus came, I held it down and rode to Gainesville. In Gainesville, I thought I'd sleep by the railroad tracks a while, but they were about a mile away, and just as I thought of sleeping in the yard, a local crew came out to switch and saw me. So I retired to an empty lot by the tracks, but the cop car kept circling around using its spot. It probably heard of me from the railroad men, probably not. So I gave it up, mosquitoes anyway, and went back to town and stood waiting for a ride in the bright lights by the luncheonettes of downtown. The cops seeing me plainly and therefore not searching for me or worrying about me. But no ride and dawn coming, so I slept in a four-dollar room in a hotel and showered and rested well. But what feelings of homelessness and bleak again as the Christmas trip east. All I had to be really proud of were my fine new thick-soled work shoes and my full pack. In the morning after breakfast, in a dismal Georgia restaurant with revolving fans on the ceiling and mucho flies, I went out on the broiling highway and got a ride from a truck driver to Flowery Branch, Georgia. Then a few spots on through Atlanta to the other side of another small town called Stonewall, where I was picked up by a big fat southerner with a broad-brimmed hat. He reeked of whiskey and kept telling jokes and turning to look at me to see if I laughed. Meanwhile, sending the car sputtering into the soft shoulders and leaving big clouds of dust behind us, so long before he reached the destination, I begged off. So I wanted to get off to eat. Heck, boy, I'll eat with you. If you heck, boy, I'll eat with you and drive you and drive you on. He was drunk and he drove very fast. Well, I gotta go to the toilet, I said, trailing off my voice. The experience had bugged me, so I decided. The hell with hitchhiking. I've got enough money to take a bus to El Paso, and from there I'll hop Southern Pacific freights and be ten times safer. Besides, the thought of being all the way out in El Paso, Texas, in that dry southwest of clear blue skies and endless desert land to sleep in, no cops, made up my mind. I was anxious to get out of the south, out of Chain Gang, Georgia. The bus came at 4 o'clock, and we were at Birmingham, Alabama in the middle of the night, where I waited on the bench for my next bus trying to sleep on my arms on my rucksack, but kept waking up to see the pale ghosts of American bus stations wandering around. In fact, one woman streamed by like a wisp of smoke. I was definitely certain she didn't exist for sure. On her face, the phantasmal belief in what she was doing. On my face, for that matter, too. After Birmingham, it was soon Louisiana, and then East Texas oil fields. Then Dallas, then a long day's ride and a bus crowded with servicemen along the long, immense waste of Texas to the ends of it, El Paso. Arriving at midnight by now, being so exhausted, all I wanted to do was sleep. I didn't go to a hotel. I had to watch my money now. Instead, I just hauled my pack to my back and walked straight for the railroad yards to stretch my bag out somewhere behind the tracks. It was then, that night, that I realized the dream that had made me want to buy the pack. It was a beautiful night, the most beautiful sleep of my life. First, I went to the yards and walked through, wearily behind lines of boxcars, and got out to the west end of the yard, but kept going because suddenly I saw in the dark there was indeed a lot of desert land out there. I could see rocks, dry bushes, imminent mountains of them faintly in the starlight. Why well, hang around viaducts and tracks, I reason, when all I gotta do is exert a little footwork, and I'll be safely out of reach of all yard cops and bums, too, for that matter. I just kept walking along the main line track for a few miles, and soon I was in the open desert mountain country. My thick boots walked well on the ties and rocks. It was now about 1 a.m. I longed to sleep off the long trip from Carolina. Finally, I saw a mountain to the right I liked after passing a long valley with many lights in it, distinctly a penitentiary or prison. Stay away from that yard, son, I thought. I went up a dry arroyo, and in the starlight, the sand and rocks were white. I climbed and climbed. Suddenly, I was exhilarated to realize I was completely alone and safe, and nobody was going to wake me up all night long. What an amazing revelation! And I had everything I needed right on my back. I put fresh bus station water in my polydenum bottle before leaving. I climbed up the arroyo, so finally when I turned and looked back, I could see all of Mexico, all of Chihuahua, the entire sand-glittering desert of it, under a late sinking moon that was huge and bright just over the Chihuahua Mountains. The Southern Pacific Rails ran right along parallel to the Rio Grande River outside of El Paso. So from where I was on the American side, I could see right down to the river itself separating the two borders. The sand in the arroyo was soft, as, was soft as silk. I spread my sleeping bag on it and took off my shoes and had a slug of water and lit my pipe and crossed my legs and felt glad. Not a sound. It was still winter in the desert. Far off just the sound of the yards where they were kicking cuts of cars with a great splone waking up all El Paso, but not me. All I had for companionship was that moon of Chihuahua sinking lower and lower as I looked, losing its white light and getting more and more yellow butter. 
Yet when I turned into sleep, it was bright as a lamp in my face, and I had to turn my face away to sleep. In keeping with my naming of little spots with personal names, I called this spot Apache Gulch. I slept well indeed. In the morning, I discovered a rattlesnake trail in the sand, but that night, of, but that might have been from the summer before. There were very few boot marks, and those were hunter's boots. The sky was flawlessly blue in the morning. The sun hot, plenty of little dry wood to light a breakfast fire. I had cans of pork and beans in my spacious pack. I had a royal breakfast. The problem now was water, though, as I drank it all and the sun was hot and I got thirsty. I climbed up the arroyo, investigating it further, and came to the end of it, a solid wall of rock, and at the foot of it, even deeper, softer sand than that of the night before. I decided to camp there that night, after a pleasant day spent in old Juarez, enjoying the church and streets and food of Mexico. For a while, I contemplated leaving my pack hidden among rocks. But the chances were slim, yet possible, that some old hobo or hunter would come along and find it, so I hauled it on my back and went down the arroyo to the rails again and walked back three miles into El Paso and left the pack in a 25-cent locker in the railroad station. Then I walked through the city and out the border gate and crossed over for two pennies. It turned out to be an insane day, starting sanely enough, in the Church of Mary Guadalupe in a saunter in the Indian markets and resting on park benches among the gay childlike Mexicans but later the bars and a few too many drinks, yelling at old mustachioed Mexican peons, Todas las granas de arena del desierto de Chihuahua son vacuidad. And finally, I ran into a bunch of evil Mexican Apaches of some kind who took me to their dripping stone pad and turned me on by candlelight and invited their friends. And it was all a lot of shadowy heads by candlelight and smoke. In fact, I got sick of it and remembered my perfect white sand gulch and the place where I would sleep tonight, and I excused myself. But they didn't want me to leave. One of them stole a few things from a bag of purchases, but I didn't care. One of the Mexican boys was queer and had fallen in love with me and wanted to go to California with me. It was night now in Juarez. All the nightclubs were wailing away. We went for a short beer in one nightclub, which was exclusively Negro soldiers sprawling around with senoritas in their laps. A mad bar with rock and roll in the jukebox. A regular paradise. A Mexican kid wanted me to go down all alleys and go, tss, tss, and tell American boys that I knew where there were some girls. Then I'd bring them to my room. Tss, tss. No girls, said the Mexican kid. The only place I could shake him was at the border gate. We waved goodbye, but it was the evil city, and I had my virtuous desert waiting for me. I walked anxiously over the border and through El Paso and out to the railroad station, got my bag out, heaved a big sigh, and went right on down those three miles to the arroyo, which was easy to re-recognize in the moonlight, and on up, my feet making that lonely flop-flop of Jaffe's boots, and I realized I had indeed learned from Jaffe how to cast off the evils of the world and the city and find my true, pure soul, just as long as I had a decent pack on my back. I got back to my camp and spread the sleeping bag and thanked the Lord for all he was giving me. Now the remembrance of the whole long evil afternoon smoking marijuana with slant-hatted Mexicans in a musty candlelit room was like a dream, a bad dream, like one of my dreams on the straw mat at Buda Creek, North Carolina. I meditated and prayed. There just isn't any kind of night's sleep in the world that can compare to the night's sleep you get in the desert winter night, providing you're good and warm in a duck-down bag. The silence is so intense that you can hear your own blood roar in your ears, but louder that, by far, is a mysterious roar, which I always identify with the roaring of the diamond of wisdom, the mysterious roar of the silence itself, which is a great shh, reminding you of something you seem to have forgotten in the stress of your days since birth. I wish I could explain it to those I love, to my mother, to Jaffe, for there just weren't any words to describe the nothingness and purity of it. Is there a certain and definite teaching to be given to all living creatures? Was the question probably asked. To beetle browed snowy Ipacara, and his answer was the roaring silence of the diamond. Chapter 23. In the morning, I had to get the show on the road or never get to my protective shack in California. I had about eight dollars left of the cash I'd brought with me. I went down to the highway and started hitchhike, hoping to quick luck. The salesman gave me a ride. He said, 360 days out of the year we get bright sunshine here in El Paso. My wife just bought a clothes dryer. He took me to Las Cruces, New Mexico, and there I walked through the little town following the highway and came out on the other end, saw a big beautiful old tree and decided to just lay my pack down and rest anyhow. Since it's a dream already ended, then I'm already in California, then I've already decided to rest under the tree at noon, which I did on my back, even napping a while, pleasantly. Then I got up and walked over the railroad bridge, and just then a, a man saw me. 
and said, how would you like to earn $2 an hour helping me to move a piano? I needed the money and said, okay. He left my rucksack in his moving storage room and went off in his little truck to a home in the outskirts of Las Cruces where a lot of nice middle-class people were chatting on the porch. And the man and I got out of the truck with a hand truck and the pads and got the piano out, also a lot of other furniture, then transported it to their new house and got that in. And that was that. Two hours, he gave me $4. I went to a truck stop diner and had a royal meal. It was all set for that afternoon and night. Just then a car stopped, driven by a big Texan with a sombrero, with a big, poor Mexican couple, a young and with a poor Mexican couple, young, in the back seat, the girl carrying an infant, and he offered me a ride all the way to Los Angeles for ten dollars. I said, I'll give you all a can, which is only four. But oh well god damn it, come on anyway. He talked and talked and drove all night straight through Arizona and California desert, left me off in Los Angeles a stone's throw from my railroad yards at nine o'clock in the morning. And the only disaster was the poor little Mexican wife had spilled some baby food on my rucksack on the floor of the car, and I wiped it off angrily, but they had been nice people. In fact, driving through Arizona, I'd explained a little Buddhism to them, specifically karma, reincarnation, and they all seemed pleased to hear the news. You mean another chance to come back and try again? asked the poor little Mexican, who was all bandaged from a fight in Juarez the night before. That's what they say. Well, God damn it! next time I be born, I hope I ain't who I am now, he said. Oh. And the big Texan, if anybody better get another chance, it was him. His stories all night long were about how he slugged so-and-so for such-and-such. -such. From what he said, he had knocked enough men out to form Coxie's army of avenged phantasmal grievers crawling on to Texas land. But I noticed he was more of a big fibber than anything else and didn't believe half his stories and stopped listening at midnight. Now 9 a.m. in Los Angeles, I walked to the railroad yards, had a cheap breakfast of donuts and coffee in a bar sitting at the counter, chatting with the Italian bartender who wanted to know what I was doing with the big rucksack. Then I went to the yards and sat in the grass watching them make up the trains. Proud of myself because I used to be a brakeman, I made the mistake of wandering around the yards with my rucksack on my back chatting with a switchman, asking about the next local, and suddenly here came a big young cop, gun swinging and a holster on his hip, all done up like on TV, the sheriff of Cochise and White Herb. Give me a steely look through dark glasses, orders me out of the yards. So he watches me as I go over the overpass to the highway, standing there, arms akimbo. Mad, I went back down the highway and jumped over the railroad fence and lay flat in the grass for a while. Then I set up and chewed grass, keeping lower, however, and waited. Soon I heard a highball blow, and I knew that knew what train was ready. And I climbed over cars to my train and jumped on it as it was pulling out and rode right out of the L.A. yards, lying on my back with a grass stem in my mouth right under the unforgiving gaze of my policeman. who was now arms akimbo for a different reason. In fact, he scratched his head. The local went to Santa Barbara, where again I went to the beach. Had to swim, some food over a fine wood fire in the sand. Came back to the yard with plenty of time to catch the Midnight Ghost. The Midnight Ghost is composed mainly of flat cars with truck tailors lashed on them by steel cables. The huge wheels of the trucks are encased in wood blocks. Since I always lay my head down right by those wood blocks, it would be goodbye, Ray, if there was ever a crash. I figured if it was my destiny to die on the Midnight Ghost, it was my destiny. I figured God had work for me to do yet. The ghost came right on schedule, and I got on a flat car under a truck, spread out my bag, stuck my shoes under my ballad coat for a pillow, relaxed inside. Zoom, we were gone. And now I know why the bums call it the Midnight Ghost. Because exhausted against all better judgment, I fell fast asleep and only woke up under the glare of the yard office lights in San Luis Obispo. A very dangerous situation. The train had stopped just in the wrong way, but there wasn't a soul in sight around the yard office. It was mid of night. Besides, just then, as I woke up from a perfect dream of sleep, the highball was going boff, boff, up front, and we were already pulling out, exactly like ghosts. And I didn't wake up then till almost San Francisco in the morning. I had a dollar left, and Gary was waiting for me at the shack. The whole trip had been as swift and enlightening as a dream, and I was back. If the Dharma bums ever get chapter 24... If the Dharma bums ever get lay brothers in America who live normal lives with wives and children in homes, they will be like Sean Monahan. Sean was a young carpenter who lived in an old wooden house far up a country road from the huddled cottages of Corte Madera, drove an old jalopy, personally added a porch to the back of the house to make a nursery for later children. He had selected a wife who agreed with him in every detail about how to live a joyous life in America without much money. Sean liked to take days off from his job to just go up the hill to the shack, which belonged to the property he rented, and 
spent a day of meditation and study of the Buddhist sutras and just brewing himself pots of tea and taking naps. His wife was Christine, a beautiful young honey-haired girl, her hair falling way down over her shoulders. Little Rick and Morty homage there. He wandered around the house and yard, barefooted, hanging up wash, and baking her own brown bread and cookies. She was an expert on making food out of nothing. The year before, J.P. had made them an anniversary gift, which was a huge 10-pound bag of flour, and they were very glad to receive it. Sean, in fact, was just an old-time patriarch. Though he was only 22, he wore a full beard like St. Joseph, and in it you could see his pearly white teeth smiling and his young blue eyes twinkling. He already had two little daughters who also wandered around barefoot in the house and yard and were brought up to take care of themselves. Sean's house had woven straw mats on the floor, and there, too, when you come in, you're required to take off your shoes. He had lots of books, and the only extravagance was a hi-fi so he could play his fine collection of Indian records and flamenco records and jazz. He even had Chinese and Japanese records. The dining table was a low, black, lacquer, Japanese-style table, and to eat in Sean's house, you not only had to be in your socks, but sitting on mats at his table. Any way you could. Christine was a great one for delicious soups and fresh biscuits. When I arrived there at night that day, getting off the Greyhound bus and walking up the tar road about a mile, Christine immediately had me sit down to hot soup and hot bread with butter. She was a gentle creature. Sean and J.P. are both working on his job at Sausalito. They'll be home about five, she said. I'll go up to the shack and look at it and wait up there this afternoon. Well, you can stand on here and play records if you want, she said. Well, I'll get out of your way, I said. You won't be in my way, she said. All I'm going to do is hang out the wash and bake some bread for tonight and mend a few things. With a wife like that, Sean, working only dis desultorily at carpentry, had managed to put a few thousand dollars in the bank. And like a patriarch of old, Sean was generous. He always insisted on feeding you, and if 12 people were in the house, he would lay out a big dinner, a simple dinner, but delicious, on a board outside in the yard, and always a big jug of red wine. It was a communal arrangement, though. He was strict about that. We'd make collections for the wine, and if people came, as they all did for a long weekend, they were expected to bring food or food money. They went out under the trees and the stars of the yard, with everybody well-fed and drinking red wine. Sean would take out his guitar and sing folk songs. Whenever I got tired of it, I'd climb my hill and go to sleep. After eating lunch and talking a while to Christine, I went up the hill. It climbed steeply right at the back door. Huge ponderosas and other pines, and in the property adjoining Sean's, a dreamy horse meadow with wildflowers and two beautiful bays with their sleek necks bent to the butterfat grass in the hot sun. Boy, this is going to be greater than North Carolina woods, I thought, stared at starting up. In the slope of grass was where Sean and Jaffe had felled three huge eucalyptus trees and had already bucked them, sawed whole logs with a chainsaw. Now the block was set, and I could see where they had begun to split the logs with wedges and sledgehammers and double bittered axes. The little trail up the hill went so steeply that you almost had to lean over and walk like a monkey. I followed a long cypress road that had been planted by the old man who had died on the hill a few years ago. This prevented the cold, foggy winds from the ocean from blasting across the property unhindered. There were three stages to the climb. Sean's backyard, then a one night, five of them resting. The whole area was a game refuge, then the final fence, and the top grassy hill with its sudden hollow on the right where the shack was barely visible under trees and flowery bushes. Behind the shack, a well-built affair actually of three big rooms, but only one room occupied by J.P. There's plenty of good firewood and a sawhorse and axes and an outdoor privy with no roof, just a hole in the ground and a board. It was like the first morning in the world in fine yard, with the sun streaming in through the dense sea of leaves, the birds and butterflies jumping around, warm, sweet, the smell of higher hills, heather, and flowers beyond the barbed wire fence which led to the very top of the mountain and showed you a vista of all of the Marin County area. I went inside the shack. On the door was a board with Chinese inscriptions on it. I never did find out what it meant. Probably Mara stay away, Mara the tempter. Inside I saw the beautiful simplicity of J.P.'s way of living. Neat, sensible, strangely rich without a scent, having been spent on the decoration. Oak clay jars exploded with bouquets of flowers picked around the yard. His books were neatly stacked in orange crates, the floor was covered with inexpensive straw mats. The walls, as I say, were lined with burlap, which is one of the finest wallpapers you can have. Very attractive and nice smelling. Jaffe's mat was covered with a thin mattress and a paisley shawl over that, and at the head of it, neatly rolled for the day, his sleeping bag. Behind burlap drapes and a closet in his rucksack and junk were put away from sight. 
from the burlap wall hung beautiful prints of old Chinese silk paintings and maps of Marin County in northwest Washington, and various poems he had written and just stuck on an L for anybody to read. The latest poem superimposed over, the, over others on the nail said, It started just now with a hummingbird stopping over the porch two yards away through the open doors and gone. It stopped me studying and I saw the old redwood post leaning in clawed ground, tangled in a huge bush of yellow flowers higher than my head, through which I pushed every time I come inside. The shadow network of the sunshine through its vines. White crowned sparrows make tremendous singing in the trees. The rooster down the valley crows and crows. Sean Monahan outside, behind my back, reads the Diamond Sutra in the sun. Yesterday I read Migration of Birds, the Golden Plover and the Arctic Tern. Today that big attraction's at my door. The juncos and the robins soon will leave when the nesting scrabblers will pick up all the string. And soon in hazy day of April, summer heat across the hill, without a book I'll know. The seabirds will chase spring north along the coast. They'll be nesting in Alaska in six weeks. And it was signed. Japheth M. Ryder, Cypress Cabin, 18, chapter 18, verse 3, subverse 56. I didn't want to disturb anything in the house till he got back from work, so I went out and lay down in the tall green grass in the sun, in the sun and waited all afternoon dreaming. But then I realized I might as well make a nice supper for Japhy, and I went down the hill again, and down the road to the store, and bought beans, salt pork, various groceries, and came back and lit a fire in the wood stove and boiled up a good pot of New England beans with molasses and onions. I was amazed at the way J.P. stored his food. Just on the shelf by the wood stove, two onions, an orange, a bag of wheat germ, cans of curry powder, rice, mysterious pieces of dried Chinese seaweed, a bottle of soy sauce to make his mysterious Chinese dishes. His salt and pepper was all neatly wrapped up in little plastic wrappers bound with elastic. There wasn't anything in the world J.P. would ever waste or lose. Now I was introducing into his kitchen all the big substantial pork and beans of the world. Maybe he wouldn't like it. He also had a big chunk of Christine's fine brown bread and his bread knife was a dagger simply stuck into the board. It got dark and I waited in the yard, letting the pot of beans keep warm on the fire. I chopped some wood and added it to the pile behind the stove. The fog began to blow in from the Pacific. The trees bowed deeply and roared. From the top of the hill you could see nothing but trees, trees, a roaring sea of trees. It was paradise. As I got cold, I went inside and stoked up the fire, singing and closed the windows. The windows were simply removable opaque plastic pieces that had been cleverly carpentered by Whitey Jones, Christine's brother. They let in light, but you couldn't see anything outdoors, and they, and they cut off the cold wind. Soon it was warm in the cozy cabin. By and by, I heard a whoo out in the roaring sea of fog trees, and it was Jaffe coming back. I went out to greet him. He was coming across the tall, final grass, rear from the day's work, clomping along in his boots, his coat over his back. Well, Smith, here you are. I cooked up a nice pot of beans for you, I said. You did? He was tremendously grateful. Boy, what a relief to come home from work and don't have to cook up a meal yourself. I'm starved. He pitched right into the beans with bread and hot coffee. I made in a pan and on the stove. Just French-style brewing coffee stirred with a spoon. We had a great supper and then lit up our pipes and talked with the fire roaring. Ray, you're going to have a great summer up on that desolation peak. I'll tell you all about it. Well, I'm going to have a great spring right here in this shack, I said. Darn right. First thing we do this week is invite some nice new girls I know, Psyche and Polly Whitmore. Now, wait a minute. Hmm. I can't invite both of them. They both love me, and they'll be, je and they'll be jealous. Anyway, we'll have big parties every weekend, starting downstairs at Sean's and ending up here. And I'm not working tomorrow, so we'll cut some firewood for Sean. That's all I want you to do. Though, if you want to work on that job of ours in Sausalito next week, you can make ten bucks a day. Fine. That'll buy a lot of pork and beans and wine. J.P. pulled out a fine brush drawing of a mountain. Here's your mountain that'll loom over you. Hosa mean. I drew it myself two summers ago from Crater Peak. In 1952, I first went to the Skagit country, hitched from Frisco to Seattle, and then in with a beard just starred and a bear-shaved head. Bear-shaved head? Why? Would it be like a bhikkhu? You know what it says in the sutras. But what did people think about you hitchhiking around with a bear-shaved head? I asked. Well, they thought I was crazy, but everybody that'd give me a ride, I'd spin them the Dharma boy and leave them light. I should have done a bit of that myself, hitching out here just now. I've got to tell you about my arroyo in the desert mountains. Wait a minute, so they put me on Crater Mountain Lookout, but the snow was so deep in the high country that year, I worked trail for a month first in Granite Creek Gorge, he said. We see all those places, and then with a string of mules, we made it to the final seven miles of winding Tibetan Rock Trail, 
above Timberline over snowfields to the final jagged pinnacles. It then climbed the cliffs in a snowstorm, and I opened my cabin and cooked my first dinner while the wind howled and the ice grew on two walls in the wind. Boy, wait till you get up there. That year, my friend Jack Joseph was on Desolation, where you'll be. What a name. Desolation. Oh, wow. Uh, wait. He was the first look up to go up, he said. I got him on my radio first off, and he welcomed me to the community of lookouts. Later, I contacted other mountains. See, they give you a two-way radio. It's almost a ritual all the lookouts chat and talk about bears they've seen, or sometimes ask instructions for how to bake muffins on a wood stove and so on. And there we all were in a high world talking on a net of wireless across hundreds of miles of wilderness. It's a primitive area where you're going, boy. From my cabin, I could see the lamps of desolation after dark. Jack Joseph reading his geology books, and in the day we flashed by mirror to align our fire finder transits accurate to the compass. Gee, uh, how I'll ever learn all that? I'm just a simple bomb poet, I remarked. Oh, you'll learn, he, he said. The magnetic pole, the pole star, the northern lights. Every night Jack Joseph and I talked. One day he got a swarm of ladybugs on the lookout that covered the roof and filled up his water cistern. Another day he went for a walk along the ridge and stepped right on a sleeping bear. Oh, I thought this place was wild. Oh, this is nothing. And when the lightning storm came by closer and closer, he called to finally say he was going off the air because the storm was too close to leave his radio on. He disappeared from sound and then sight as the black clouds swept over and the lightning danced on his hill. But as the summer passed, desolation got dry and flowery and flaky lambs and he wandered the cliffs and I was on Crater Mountain in my jock strap and boots, hunting on ptarmigan nests out of curiosity, climbing and pooking about, getting bit by bees. Desolation's way up there, Ray. 6,000 feet or so up, up looking into Canada and the, and the Chelan Highlands, the wilds of the Picket Range and mountains like Challenger, Terror, Fury, Despair, and the name of your own ridge is Starvation Ridge. And the upcountry of the Boston Peak and Buckner Peak range to the south thousands of miles of mountains, deer, bear, conies, hawks, trout, chipmunks. It'll be great for you, Ray. Oh, I look forward to it, okay? I bet no bee bites me. Then he took out his books and read a while, and I read too. Both of us with separate oil lamps spanked low, a quiet evening, at home as the foggy wind roared in the trees outside and across the valley, a mournful mule he hawed in one of the most tremendous heartbroken cries I've ever heard. When that mule weeps like that, says Jaffe, I feel like praying for all sentient beings. Then for a while he meditated motionless in the full lotus position on his mat, and then said, Well, time for bed. But now I wanted to tell him all the things I discovered that winter meditating in the woods. Oh, it's just a lot of words, he said, sadly, surprising me. I don't want to hear all your word descriptions of words, words, words you made up all winter. Man, I want to be enlightened by actions. Jaffe had changed since the year before, too. He no longer had his goatee, which had removed the funny, merry little look of his face, but left him looking gaunt and rocky-faced. Also, he'd cut his hair in a close crew cut, and looked Germanic and stern, and above all sad. There seemed to be some kind of disappointment in his face now, and certainly in his soul. He wouldn't listen to my eager explanations that everything was all right forever and forever and forever. Suddenly he said, I'm going to get married soon, I think. I'm getting tired of batting around like this. But I thought you'd discover this in ideal poverty and freedom. Oh, maybe I'm getting tired of all that. After I come back from the monastery in Japan, I'll probably have my fill of it anyway. Maybe I'll be rich and work and make a lot of money and live in a big house. But a minute later, and who wants to enslave himself to a lot of all that, though? I don't know, Smith, I'm just depressed, and everything you're saying just depresses me further. My sister's back in town, you know. Who's that? Well, that's Rhoda, my sister. I grew up with her in the woods in Oregon. She's going to marry this rich jerk from Chicago. A real square. My father's having trouble with his sister, too, my Aunt Noss. She's an old bitch from way back. You shouldn't have cut off your goatee, I said. You used to look like a happy little sage. Well, I ain't happy little sage no more, and I'm tired. He's, he was exhausted from a long, hard day's work. We decided to go to sleep and forget it. In fact, we were a bit, we were a bit sad and sore at each other. During the day, I discovered a spot by a wild rose bush in the yard where I planned to lay out my sleeping bag. I covered it a foot deep with fresh pulled grass. Now, with my flashlight and my bottle of cold water from the sink tap, I went out there and rolled into a beautiful night's rest under the sign trees, meditating while first. I couldn't meditate indoors anymore like Jaffe had just done. After all that winter in the woods of night, I had to hear the little sounds of animals and birds and feel the cold 
sign earth under me before I could rightly get to feel a kinship with all living things as being empty and awake and saved already. I prayed for JP. It looked like he was changing for the worse. At dawn, a little rain pattered on my sleeping bag, and I put my poncho over me instead of under me, cursing, and slept on. At seven in the morning, the sun was out, and butterflies were in the roses by my head, and Hummingbird did a jet dive right down at me, whistling and darted away happily. But I was mistaken about Jeffy changing. It was one of the greatest mornings in our lives. There he was, standing on the doorway of the shack, with a big frying pan in his hand, banging on it, chanting, Budam Saranam Gochami Dalamam Saranam Gochami Sangam Saranam Gochami And yelling, Come on, boy, your pancakes are ready. Come and get it. Bang, 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 bang. And the orange sun was pouring into, in through the pines, and everything was right again. In fact, Jaffe had contemplated that night, and I decided and decided I was right about hewing to the good old Dharma. By the way, that Sanskrit means I take refuge in the threefold uh, Buddha nature. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dhamma or the teachings. I take refuge the teachings and practice, and I take refuge in the Sangam, the community. Jaffe had cooked up some good buckwheat pancakes, and we had long cabin syrup to go with them and a little butter. I asked him what the Gochami chant meant. That's a chant that give, they give out for the three mills and Buddhist monasteries in Japan. It means Buddha Am Saranam Gochami. I take refuge in the Buddha, Sangam, and I take refuge in the church, Dhamma. Oh, okay, he explains it. I take refuge in the Dhamma, the truth. Tomorrow morning I'll make you another nice breakfast, some gullion. You never eat good old-fashioned slum gullion, boy. Tain't nothing but scrambled eggs and potatoes all scrambled up together. It's a lumberjack meal, I asked. There ain't no such thing as lumberjack. That must be a back east expression. Up here we call them loggers. Come on, eat up your pancakes. We'll go down and split logs, and I'll show you how to handle a double-bladed axe. He took the axe out, sharpened it, showed me how to sharpen it. Don't ever use this axe on a piece of wood that's on the ground. You'll hit rocks and blunt it. I always have a log or something for a block. I went out to the privy, and coming back, wishing to surprise JP with his end trick, I threw the roll of toilet paper through the open window, and... He let, a, let out a big samurai warrior roar and appeared on the windowsill in his boots and shorts with a dagger in his hand and jumped 15 feet down into the loggy yard. It was crazy. He started downhill feeling high. All the logs had been fucked, had more or less of a crack in them, where you more or less inserted the heavy iron wedge and then raising a five-pound sledgehammer over your head, standing way back so as not to hit your own ankle, you brought it down, conked on the wedge, and split the log clean in half. Then you would sit the half logs up on a black block log and let it down with a double bitted axe, a long, beautiful axe, sharp as a razor, and for what? You had quarter logs. Then he set up a quarter log and brought down to an eighth. He showed me how to swing the sledge and the axe, not too hard, but when he got mad himself, I noticed he swung the axe as hard as he could, roaring his famous cry or cursing. Pretty soon I had the knack and I was going along as though I'd been doing it all my life. Christine came out in the yard to watch us and called, I'll have some nice lunch for you. Okay. Jaffe and Christine were like brother and sister. We split a lot of logs. It was great swinging down the sledgehammer, all the weight clink on top of the wedge, a filling that log give, but not for the first time the second time. The smell of sawdust, pine trees, the breeze blowing over the placid mountains from the sea, the metal arc singing, the butterflies in the grass, it was perfect. Then we went in and ate a good lunch of hot dogs and rice and soup and red wine and Christine's fresh biscuits, and sat there cross-legged and barefoot, thumbing through Sean's vast library. Did you hear about the disciple who asked the Zen master, what is the Buddha? No, what? The Buddha's a dry piece of turd, was the answer. The disciple experienced sudden enlightenment. Simple shit, I said. Do you know what sudden enlightenment is? He asked. One disciple came to the master and answered his koan, and the master and the master hit hit him with a stick and knocked him off the veranda ten feet into a mud puddle. The disciple got up and laughed. He later became a master himself. It wasn't my words, he was enlightened, but by that great healthy push off the porch. All wallowing in mud to prove the crystal truth of compassion, I thought. I wasn't about to start advertising my words out loud any more to Jaffe. Woo! He yelled, throwing a flower at my head. Did you know how Kasyapa Kus became the first patriarch? The Buddha was about to start expounding a sutra, and 1,250 bhikkhus were waiting with their garments arranged and their feet crossed, and all the Buddha did was raise a flower. Everybody was perturbed. The Buddha didn't say nothing. Only Kasyapa smiled. 
That was how the Buddhists selected Kasyapa, and that's known as the flower sermon, boy. I went in the kitchen and got a banana and came out and said, Well, I'll tell you what Nirvana is. What? I ate the banana, threw the pill away, said nothing. That's the banana sermon, he said. Whoo, yelled Jaffe. Did I ever tell you about Coyote Old Man and how him and the Silver Fox started the world by stomping an empty space till a little ground appeared beneath their feet? Look at this picture, by the way. This is the famous bullshit. Wait, this is the famous bulls. It was an ancient Chinese card showing... Oops. <laughs> it was a... It was an ancient Chinese cartoon showing first a young boy going out into the wilderness with a small staff and pack like an American Nat Wills champ of 1905. In later panels, he discovers an ox, tries to tame it, tries to ride it, finally does tame it, and ride it with then, but then abandons the ox and just sits Final. in the moonlight meditating. Final. Okay. Well, take care of it, buddy. Okay. Finally does tame it and ride it, but then abandons the ox and just sits in the moonlight meditating. Finally, you see him coming down from the mountain of enlightenment, and then suddenly... The next panel shows absolutely nothing at all. Ah! <laughs> Followed by a panel showing blossoms in a tree. Then the last picture Legos, you see the young Legos. boy is a big fat old laughing wizard with a huge bag on his back. And he's going into the city to get drunk with the butchers. Enlightened. And another new young boy is going up to the mountain with a little pack of staff. He goes on and on. The disciples and the masters go through the same thing. First they have to find and tame the ox of their mind essence. And then abandon that. Then finally they attain to nothing. Is represented by this empty panel, then having attained nothing, they attain everything which is springtime blossoms in the trees, so they end up coming down to the city to get drunk with the butchers, like Lee Poe. That was a very wise cartoon. It reminded me of my own experience, trying to tame my trying to tame my mind in the woods. Then realizing it was all empty and awake, and I didn't have to do anything, and now I was getting drunk with a butcher Jaffe. We played records and lounged around, smoking, then went out, cut more wood. Then as it got cool late afternoon, we went up to the shack and washed and dressed up for the big Saturday night party. During the day, J.P. went up and down the hill at least ten times to make phone calls and see Christine and get bread and bring up sheets for his girl that night. When he had a girl, he put out clean sheets on a thin mattress on the straw mats, a ritual. But I just sat around in the grass doing nothing or riding IQs or watching the old vultures circling the hill. Must be something dead around here, I figured. J.P. said, Why do you just sit on your ass all day? I practice do nothing, I said. What's the difference? Burn it. My Buddhism is activity, said J.P., rushing off down the hill again. Then I could hear him sawing wood and whistling in the distance. He couldn't stop jiggling for a minute. His meditations are regular things. What do you want, bud? Um, Not right now. But they, Wait till I'm done with this chapter. Okay, how much more long? Okay, you can have it. Sorry, my Bodhi, my boot, my boy Bodhi has uh, demanded to use the computer to play some game. 